the future in the learning lab to introduce our afternoon. Brian, I'm going to have my way here. I'll go ahead and introduce that. So, uh, welcome again to the, the afternoon keynote here. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce you guys to uh, Cy Weiss, who's a game industry generalist, a consultant, and sociologist residing in Austin, Texas. She's a, a 10 year game industry veteran who's worked on award winning MMO titles like Lineage 1 and 2, Guild Wars 1 and 2, Richard Garriott's Tabula Rasa, uh, Wizard 101, and uh, She's also known for working on one of my favorite VR games, uh, Job Simulator. And there's a rumor going around that there's going to be some vibes here during the Pure Michigan event from 7 to 10. So you might have to come over there, check it out, uh, you know, eat some of the rotten donuts and play some Job Simulator and have her egg you on while you're playing. But um, when she's not professionally managing VR communities, she also casually manages them. She's a co-organizer of uh, VR Austin the second largest VR meetup in the United States. Uh, she's currently Al, Kelly, Al Kelly's Labs <laughs> multi-hat wearing designer, marketer, writer, community wrangler, and awesome name here, Owl Lancer. So please join me in welcoming Cy Wise up here in her talk, playing in a new reality in the virtual landscape. speakers and to learn so much and met fantastic people and have fantastic conversations. This has been really great and I'm really glad you guys invited me. Um, so this is my face, this is my giant face. For those of you who can't see my face, behold, I have a face for you. Uh, a little about me, I'm Sai, but a little about me. Um, I currently work at Alchemy Labs. Uh, and I already had that wonderful introduction. Um, so another thing that we're working on besides uh, uh, job simulators, also working on Morty Simulator. Um, so my official title is Owl Mancer, um, uh, Community Events Wrangler, Palma Science. Uh, <laughs> this is our joke slinging way of saying that I wear kind of an infinite amount of hats, uh, most of which deal with people, communication, and studio management. Uh, I've worked on Play MMOs. Lineage series, uh, Richard, Richard Garrett's Tabula Rasa, all of these things. Um, I found that there was a lot of handed down best practices developed over the years in these industries, um, but there wasn't so much talk about the workings behind those decisions. So I actually stopped working in AAA MMO some years ago and went back to school for sociology. I went to University of Texas and I specialized in digital tribes and uh, internet fandoms and computer media communication. While well, I was in school, the indie VR game dev community started growing, and when I came out, I launched myself as quickly as possible toward VR. Yeah, it's fantastic. And in that pursuit, I ended up joining uh, the organizer team of VR Austin, um, which is an event I'm actually really proud of. Uh, it's the second largest uh, meetup of VR devs and enthusiasts in the nation. We meet every other month, and we just hang out and talk and discuss VR, things we've learned. Um, throughout childhood, um, and this is sort of like personally, or like throughout childhood, I was like a total escapist, um, a daydreamer, I was an active reader, like a lot of D&D. Uh, I was always like in one fantasy world or another. Uh, when the Oculus Kickstarter went live in 2012, um, my husband and I therefore could not throw money at it fast enough. This was, this was like our future, like our favorite like science fiction futures made form. And we wanted to participate in it. Um, when the developer kit, or the DK1, uh, finally shipped to us, uh, we started what most people experienced, which was the Tuscany demo. Uh, and the Tuscany demo is basically kind of almost exactly what you see here. There's actually, like, I think it's, it's either an ocean or a bay or something on the other side, but, you know, it's beautiful and you get to, like, walk around this, like, beautiful villa and that is simultaneously, like, run down and also well kept. I don't know how they kept those bushes so nice. I mean, there's vines crawling on it, and it's a paint job. But you could walk around. It was interesting because the shadows were really flat, and the um, the grass was clearly painted. 
the, the ocean was a little bit too repetitive. Um, but I was still really struck by that sense of presence. And it really made me think about all the places I could go. Like I wanted to go to like Peru and Paris and Alaska and like giant mega, mega cities and small coastal towns. And this made me think of all those places that I could go. And then afterwards, um, I played a game called Titans of Space. Um, has anyone played Titans of Space? Yeah, I have friends of Titans in Space. Okay, um, so Titans of Space is basically, um, you start off kind of looking at the world, you're in a, a spaceship, and you're sort of looking at um, the world from an outside perspective. I'm actually going to show you what that. Just give me a sense of me. No? That's awesome. That's awesome. Let's hang out here for a minute. So basically what happens is that you sort of like get to see the planets sort of from this, this outside perspective. And it gives you a lot of information about what you're looking at, how big it is, um, the distance between one thing and one another. Um, towards the end, it sort of backs out, and you get to see sort of the scale of planets between each other, and you get to see like the scale of like the sun versus other stars. Um, and what was different about this as opposed to the Tuscany demo so instead of thinking about, about all the places I could go, I started thinking about all the places I couldn't go. Things that I had no way of understanding um, and, and seeing and experiencing things that we haven't ever had this ability to see experience before. And this is actually the point where I, I got obsessed. I actually lost a tuna fish sandwich to this game, but like in the best possible way to lose a tuna fish sandwich. I had a tuna fish sandwich um, brought to me as, as I started this game. And then uh, I went so long into the game, and I have cats, that by the time I came out, like an hour later, I didn't feel safe eating that tuna fish sandwich anymore. So if you're going to lose a tuna fish sandwich to VR, I recommend time dilation. That's a really good way to do it. And they actually did release um, Titans of Space version 2 for the, the vibes on Steam. So I really recommend at least taking this and say it's an amazing game. So I have to do the survey. Um, who here has tried high end VR? And I'm going to talk about one of these devices. The, one of these three devices on your face. Okay, that is awesome. This is fantastic. I'm going to remember that amount of people because I'm going to tell the story of anecdotes amongst friends and peers. Um, Okay, so this is actually, I just wanted to sort of define terms before I get a little bit too far because there's a lot to talk about with VR. But I'm specifically, um, I specifically want to talk about what um, I'll, I'll be talking about with Job Simulator. And the best way to start about with this is what is VR? Um, it's just a good way to define it. This is actually a quote from Andy Moore from Radial Games, who worked on Fantastic Contraption. And I have, I cannot take credit for this pun, it's too good. I can't take credit for this one though. So I'm not talking about um, sort of the, the old VR from the 80s and 90s. Um, due to technical limitations, these were like massive pieces of equipment. Um, they were generally in arcades and research facilities. Um, and due to their size, they were mostly ridiculously out of reach for most consumers. Um, so I'm not talking 
about this. We also had weird ideas about how um, we should interface with, with VR and, and how that would work, like by strapping on as many buttons to ourselves. Um, that That is also not, when I'm saying hand tracking, which I would say, this is, this is not what I talked about. Um, I'm also not talking about these sorts of things. Today, you get a lot of people when you ask, have you tried VR? They'll talk about the DK1 that they tried or maybe messing around with the Google Cardboard or Gear VR. Um, in this particular situation, um, I'm not talking about that. Um, these lessons are mostly applied to room scale and track to VR. Oh, I forgot my note. Um, so generally, just as a little aside, when people talk about VR, they're often including many formats with various levels of interaction. So from 360 video being the least interactive, like sort of a head on a stick, like you can sort of just rotate the world around you, versus you know the hand tracked room scale, something like the Vive with Oculus Touch with the touch controllers. Um, so devs are actually currently in a, dis in a discussion about this, trying to decide like if these need to be considered different tiers or different. Um, like different words for all of these things. Um, I'm not going to go into that specifically, but um, Job Simulator is the top one. So I'm going to take a quick historical interlude to talk about uh, Job Simulator. Uh, we were initially launched and founded in 2010. We were sort of multi-platform and we did mobile games. Um, usually we use jokes, puns, jokes and puns. Um, the team also uh, kickstarted Oculus when the DK1 became available, and they immediately worked it to port their base jumping game that they named was Deja Bond Studios. So they had a base gym game called Ah. <laughs> After several weeks, like so they got their DK1 and they just basically took several weeks, just committed to putting it on the um, the Oculus DK1, and they came up with Ah Oculus. Um, it was one of the very first games created and downloaded for the DK1. And we learned a lot from this process, and as active members of the Boston Indie Dev community, we're really active about um, talking about experiences and sharing them with everybody else. So some months later, um, the team were invited by Valve to come out to Seattle for a super secret meeting um, that they didn't tell us why. It was very much a come to Seattle. Well, why Valve? Um, because we're telling you to come to Seattle. You should. You should. So we flew out there, no idea what this meeting was for, and they brought us into their, this was um, the prototype five, and they showed us basically their first prototype. Um, and this is originally how they were dealing with room track. I believe this room actually still exists in Valve, like sort of as a relic of the past, and they were used to track using QR code. Um, so the, our CEO who tried it, and the CTO tried it, were instantly sold, and we begged, begged, begged for one of their very few prototypes. And they gave it to us. Well, I'm mystified too, but they did, they gave us one. And so we took it to Winnipeg, where our CTO is from, and we locked ourselves in a basement uh, and game jammed for about a week. And the way that we went about this um, was instead of coming up with an idea for a game that we wanted to, to make and build, we, we honestly built a table and three blocks. Um, and then we got in and we started playing with them, stacking them, you know, building, trying to see how they work, knocking them over, throwing them, tossing them. And we found that physics is actually really fun. Um, so we started building more objects. Um, we started adding more and more and more things. And then we started trying to think of places where there were lots of objects. And so in the process of doing this, we basically um, used really quick, inter uh, really quick iteration and rapid prototyping to sort of like find the fun. Uh, and as we put in more, more, more and more stuff, we ended up with like, I don't know, what has stuff in it? Maybe, maybe a kitchen? I don't know. Like a garage. Skew cubicle. cubicle. So basically the one uniting thread was that they were all jobs. And so we made Job Simulator. And um, I'm going to play the trailer for you. So that you can get a sense of, so you can get a sense of sort of what this is. I will eventually learn. You know, for maybe someone who does VR, you'd think I'd do a little bit better technology. Thank you. Hello, human. Welcome to an accurate simulation of Office Worker. Time to jump. 
looks like it'll taste interesting. This is the idiot and dumbing dog. Delicious. Oh no, the last one is coming. Hey, you, you can do it. Good job. Looks like I've got some money to go. Shred everything for legal reasons. Those abstractions. 
Um, so grabbing and picking things up, we basically have two buttons that we use in Job Simulator. We use the trigger to pick things up, so you put your hand on something, you squeeze that trigger and it simulates grabbing. When you're done holding it, you let it go, right, just like in life. Let it go. Uh, and the other thing we have is a menu button. But even that menu button is used to sort of bring something into the world that is uh, interactable. We entirely believe in interactable designs, especially for menu items. Um, having a UI glued to your face um, doesn't feel very good. Um, so for example, um, how we get out of the game, we use this feature. This is the exit burrito. <laughs> it is a two-state burrito. You saw it in the, uh, in the trailer as well. Basically, you use the button to bring up the briefcase and you set it where you want it open it and the, the two part, the edible poop, it gives you a white state so that you can actually confirm your selection. There's a little sign, you can't quite see it, but like the little sign above it says, please eat your selection. <laughs> so that's one of the things we do. Uh, another thing we do is that we have a, a couple of features in the game that you can select in the beginning of the game. And all of these are actually done with actual levers and buttons. You, if you want to open up the options menu, you have to open up the options cabinet. Inside there are switches and levers, and you can then choose what you want. And all of this is a way of using, um, giving people the options that they used to have in the games, but without actually taking them out of like the virtual reality. Uh, and going on to that, uh, this minimized abstractions also makes it incredibly necessary to have intuitively interactive you're basically telling everybody um, that you can interact with everything. And so you have to interact with everything. You have to make that available. So this is Dragon Age, um, which is one of my favorite games on the planet. And I use this because I'm going to be mean for a second. But we out of love. This is a fantastic design for traditional games. This is a terrible design for VR. You have so many things around you, crates and boxes and barrels and jars and things to look at and touch and open and peer into, but the only option is to press X for schematics. Um, this is something that does not work uh, in virtual reality. As, as tiny little creatures, all we want to do is grab stuff, and some of our first interactions is reaching out and grabbing things. And so when we put a bunch of things in a world and do not let them grab them, um, immediately sort of breaks that sense of presence and breaks that reality. So what we ended up doing with Job Simulator, initially we wanted to build tons and tons and tons of jobs, like tons of jobs, lots of jokes, but we found that it was better to go deep rather than to go wide. It was better to put more objects of which all of them could be interacted with, and all of them could be messed and fussed, and there's a joke behind everything, than it was to build lots and lots of things. And we do that through use of hands. So hands is basically the major point of identity for people um, they're not just the tools they use to interact with the world, but they're also representative of yourself in this space. Um, so the design of these was super important. Um, when we first started building this, we just wanted to just throw hands in just so we could start a game. So we used um, the asset package uh, hands that come with Unity, which are, I don't know if you've seen them, but they're kind of veiny and gross. They've, they've got weird veins and bumps, and they're kind of waxy. And I, I don't know whose hands they are, or why they thought this would be okay. Um, but immediately, people people couldn't use them. Like they, they were so distracted by these weird, veiny, not their hands. We we know what our hands look like. Uh, we know what size our hands are. We know what they look like. Um, so we went with these as our second, and these actually worked much much better. Um, because we weren't trying to be anyone's hands, they were able to be everyone's hands. Um, people had no problem figuring out that this was, like, this was the, the this was their hands inside of there, and, and it's sort of accepting them as their own, which was something that we had problem with creating many persons. Um, so the other thing that we had to do with hands is sort of because everything is interactable, everything's grabbing. We played with a lot of different ways of um, picking things up. Now the problem with picking things up is that you know you can grab things from different angles, from above, from below, from the side, from the top to the bottom. You know, uh, and all of these things. Two things: one, your hand covers up the object that you're trying to focus on, and two, now you have to make a million different types of hand grasp shapes for the item that you're holding on to, depending on what you're holding and what position. You're so we call this tomato presence. Um, basically what it is is that when you grab something, the hand disappears. 
That we, this is actually the first time we ever did this, which is why we call it tomato presents. <laughs> That's literally the only reason. It's because the first thing we ever did this with was a tomato. And basically what this lets you do is really focus on the object in your hand, um, so your hand doesn't get in the way of looking at it and messing with it. Yeah, this was a Adelope tomato present. That's one of my favorites. And most people actually don't even notice this. Like most people, when they go in and play with the game, they don't notice that their hand didn't disappear. It's only later when you tell them that their hand disappeared for talking about tomato presents, that's the only time when people um, start recognizing that that actually exists. Um, and then self identification of the body is actually really important. So, as I said before, there's no feet. Like there's no, you can't look down and see. Body. That's that's not there. But um, people are very aware of, of their sense of body. Um, like for example, they, they know how tall they are. We're all really experienced at knowing our own height. Um, you can actually be off by about an inch or two, and immediately you know something's wrong. It's instant. Um, so we encountered some hardware restrictions uh, with, with some of the development process when we were doing this. So a lot of times when you do um, so for the vibe, when you're calibrating, you put the controllers on the floor so you can get an a read of the absolute height of the floor. Um, for some hardware, like for example the PlayStation VR, if there's um, the field of view of the tracked space gets really close to the floor, it's not consistently tracked. So we had to find some solutions or else people were going to be the wrong height all the time. And we tossed around a lot of ideas. We can have people manually enter their height, but not everybody knows how tall they are. Um, and it's also really cumbersome. Um, we came up with some terrible ideas. We thought, like, okay, what if we like take a control and we hold it out and we drop it? Oh. And based on the time it takes to hit the ground, we can calculate how far away we can some of these ideas better than others. Eventually, we did land on a solution based on uh, Leonardo da Vinci's Vitruvian Man. <laughs> Basically, since since the human is about the same close to the same height as their as their wingspan from from tip to I guess it's, it's span. An owl mancer, but not an actual owl. We, um, that's sort of really close to most people's height. Um, and so we implemented this. This is our CTO showing how we implemented this. So what we do is we hold the controllers out as, at, as far as possible and we squeeze the triggers. And by doing this, we um, calculate the distance between the controllers and feed it into the PlayStation VR. And then that calculates not the player's height, but it calculates where the headset is in comparison and then judges where the floor is. So we actually tell the PSVR and put in there where the floor is. So that way you can pass and play. Um, it's not going to be dependent on a single person being a specific height in order to play. Uh, and so the last thing we found was actually um, Aya's main character was, was really important. And I think probably since you played a lot of VR, you're sort of aware of this, that the experiences you have in VR experiences that you have in um, trying to put somebody in a, in a different character sort of seemed to be like going around it for some reason. But you could put the person in and they very easily believed that they themselves were in the game. So there was no need to sort of create this other character for them to be in the shoes of. And it allowed them to sort of enact and be in this world themselves. So we ended up with Game About Jobs. Um, the jobs that we chose were all pretty confined. By having a confined space, it was very natural that they wouldn't want to walk way off into the distance. There wasn't a big world for them to, um, to, to have to fight with. It was very natural for them to be there. <coughs> Every single thing you see here can be touched or punched or picked up or thrown, often mostly thrown. Um, you know, and, and find a lot of places. However, in building a real world, you need to focus to see everything. Everything and everyone, and because when you're designing a world, you're building for people. Um, you're building for individuals who all have different expectations of what that world should really be. Um, for example, uh, we, have a, we have a task in the game where we make tea. Uh, I have a very clear idea, idea of how tea should be made. I do it very often, um, and it's the same set, of, same set of tasks, same actions every single time. I put hot water in the kettle. Now, while I'm boiling, I put the tea bag in the tea in, the, in my cup. And then when the water boils, I, boil, I pour the boiling water over the tea, and then I add milk. I do that every single time. However, my friend is a monster. <laughs> <laughs> she puts the tea bag in the kettle. <gasps> she 
She puts the tea bag in the kettle. I don't understand. She boils the water with the tea bag in the kettle and then pours the whole weird liquid molten mass into a cup. It's, it's terrible. And then she has milk. Um, and then I have another friend who puts milk in the cup first and then puts the tea bag in. And this just strikes me as inherently gross. I don't, I don't know why this is gross to me. But the problem is, is that when you're, when, you have, when you're making tea, and I've seen all of these, by the way, in the game as well, when, you, when, you, when you're making tea, you have to make sure that every single one of those things results in tea. If somebody makes tea my way, the correct way, <laughs> and it clearly ends in tea, this makes sense. But if somebody makes tea the wrong way, it doesn't matter that they're wrong, immediately they're taking out, taken out of the simulation, and they start trying to, to game this. They're trying to figure out the game to the puzzle. They're trying to figure out what it is that the game developers want, as opposed to just experiencing making tea. So this is uh, an example of this. This is one of our um, one of our wonderful testers. This was during early, early focus testing of the, or sorry, play testing of the um, game, uh, the mechanic. She decided um, that donuts were. For <laughs> uh, and this robot was having a bad day, and maybe this day would be solved with lots of donuts. <laughs> so we actually have a thing chooser, we call it a thing chooser, where basically if you pull something out, it responds. So she immediately discovered infinite donuts and, and wanted to share this gift with the world. <laughs> when she finally gave the bot a spare tire, which by the way is the only reason why the bot had come in, was for this spare tire. Um, she, she finally finished the task, she was done with donuts, let the, the, the bot pay and sent her on her merry way. And uh, unfortunately this happened. All of the donuts fell out the bottom of the cap. And she had a reaction to this. <laughs> this hit her in the feelings. She was really upset about how all the donuts were gone. Uh, did, although I will say the next bot that came up uh, Again, very early in design, the spot doesn't exist anymore, but it was a police spot. And so she was like, oh, it was summoned by the donuts. <laughs> um, but this is the sort of thing that's going on. We never, we had put tons of things into the cabin car, but we had never actually put donuts or that amount of donuts. It just, it just didn't occur to us. That wasn't something that we imagined would happen. Um, so, uh, this, uh, so this was um, wonderful to test for this because you get to see what other people would do, and they think of the things that you wouldn't think of, and it helps you build a world that can sustain their madness. Although that was such a great reaction, I was a little bit sad to see it go. Oh, just one more time. <laughs> she then started eating the donuts off the floor. <laughs> this is the game I made. <laughs> The other thing that was really, really important to us in making Job Simulator was to build worlds with the opportunities for individual discovery. Um, we wanted people to be able to find their own games and, and make and find their own fun. Uh, so it, very early on in, in development, um, my, my, my boss, my CEO, Alex, is actually um, a juggler. And he decided that he wasn't going to be a part of any game unless he could juggle in it. <laughs> oh no, this is going to happen.
and that's when we realized we had no head colliders. We fixed that. She was enamored with the donuts. Uh, she decided she was going to stack them uh, to carry them anywhere. She decided just carrying at maximum two donuts was amateur hour. So she was going to try and get as many donuts as possible. But she found out that the donuts actually close, like the objects interact with each other and throwing something on one thing, would, like in this case the trunk would close the trunk. She then spent probably the next 10 minutes just throwing things at other things. <laughs> to try and knock things off of other things, knock things down on other things. Uh, this is one of the most delightful playtest sessions I've ever seen, by the way. Um, this person uh, actually, uh, and this is really as well, uh, she decided, I don't have video of this, and it's my favorite thing ever, she decided to take every single piece of trash that she could find, so like everything from the thing she she just pulled and pulled and pulled and pulled and pulled, objects and objects and donuts and air fresheners and bottles and fluids and everything, tires. She made a giant, giant pile, just in a huge pile in front of her. And she laid, and she looked at it for a while and then laid down in the middle and made a trash heap. <laughs> I will let you know that when she laid down with her intentions, we panicked. We had no idea this was going to work. But it worked. And when it worked, we realized we had made, we, we were done to ship it. <laughs> So another thing that was really important to us um, was the ability to share VR. Um, VR is actually a lot more social than we thought it would be. Um, we find that people get together and they have these, um, these VR parties where the person in the middle sort of becomes the actor and everyone surrounding starts shouting at them, telling them what to do. Um, and we have a lot of fun with this, um, but there are also um, some problems with like how to show this. Um, one of the things I do is actually a lot of events and demos. And there's a responsibility with that, right? Um, we want to make sure that people are having a good experience, or at least not that people have bad experiences. Um, and as a new consumer medium, a bad experience can actually like ruin them off from the entire medium, not just from the game they're playing. So we want to make sure that we show them an optimum setting. Uh, so the best to, way to explain it is by putting people's faces in it. Like that's the best way for people to understand it. Um, and the second best is events, um, but that can go good and bad. Um, best to me. Uh, with walls, um, that could be a tent. I've actually given them here a tent, and um, it, was, it was not an optimum situation. Um, the lights coming in through, like it worked every single time that wasn't noon. The minute it got noon, the light filtered through the roof of the tent and blinded all of the lighthouses, so everyone lost tracking. Um, at some point, the wind picked up, and someone was in VR, we actually had to hold their universe together. We had to hold the tent down as it's moving around like this. Well, someone's in VR, totally oblivious, having a grand time. I'm glad we were able to keep their world together. Um, but a lot of the way you're going to show people are going to be at these parties, at these VR parties, or you know, maybe in videos and streams. Um, so we wanted to create um, as many tools as possible to help people accomplish this. The first thing we implemented was spectator. So normally when you're in VR, you see something like this, where you have kind of, it looks like a GoPro is attached to your head, and you kind of just see, technically, you see through one of the eyes um, of the body. But generally, they either bring a composite or from one lens, they show you what's going on. We implemented um, a third-person camera so that you could look at somebody within the space within it. Now, this camera actually floats, and you can stick it wherever you want. Um, and that allows people to position it, sort of like filmmaker as well. Um, this has been really popular actually amongst uh, streamers uh, and, and Twitch streamers and YouTube video creators. It's just 
putting the camera up and then talking to it. Another thing that we implemented was actually specifically for Twitch streamers, who um, normally they had a problem with VR early on in that they couldn't um, talk to their audience. They'd always have to enlist the help of somebody else to come and read what was going on um, in their chat so that they could respond to their audience. And this was, it, it was really hard for them to do VR, and a lot of them were turned off from the idea of doing VR because of it. Uh, oh, look, it's spectator cam again. Um, so we implemented a Twitch chat window. So this is a thing that you can turn on, and it feeds in directly to your Twitch chat, and you can resize it, make it bigger or smaller, place it wherever you want. But the point of this, again, is to make something tangible and physical in the space that you can move. If you just had an overlay on the side, the UI to somebody's face, it just it doesn't feel good. And this allows them to like navigate around the space and bring it with them and place it wherever they want. Um, the last thing that we implemented, um, which I was uh, quite pleased with, was uh, mixed reality. Is uh, it, That's the new hotness, right? Like, so everyone's, everyone's looking into mixed reality now. Uh, so previously, how mixed reality works is that you take a, um, uh, you basically take somebody from a green screen you sort of cut them out and then you place them on top of the, the background, whatever the game is. Um, this has a lot of limitations, just technologically it uses a lot of hardware to do this. Um, additionally, uh, if you want to get really complex mixed reality, like what you saw in the original trailer, um, this requires sort of a, uh, uh, you have to do in post. There's no way to get a foreground. You can do a foreground background. If you're, if you're very, very good, you get a foreground background. Once you get multiple objects involved in there, um, it becomes incredibly tricky to do. So we're currently working on this mixed reality. Um, this is um, this is using a depth-based camera. So how this works, it's a little bit different, um, is that we use a depth-based camera to sort of get the depth of the person in VR. And what it does is that actually takes a read off of not just you record the individual, but you also record how far away they are from the camera. You feed this actually directly into Unity and it turns them into an asset in Unity. So this is actually playing real time in Unity. Um, if you saw earlier on, you can also flip the lights on and off and it will actually change the lighting of the person in VR. Uh, so the, the big difference is that whereas previously what you would need is either multiple computers in order to accomplish this or uh, we need to do it in post. Uh, we now have it so that we can actually feed this all for Unity and it comes out of frame rate. 30 frames per second. For, it's 30 frames per second video output, but still 90 frames per second in your headset. Um, so this is actually something that we're currently working on right now, um, and it's super crazy exciting. Um, one of the things you can do that you can't do in normal virtual reality is that you can actually hold objects in front of you and behind you. Um, you can lean over things and be both in front and behind the environment at the same time, depending on how you are. This is something that we are currently working on and we're super, super excited about. Um, and we just started sharing it um, in so we're constantly working on these challenges. Like the game's already up for the Vive and for the PlayStation VR, but we're still working on this one. So there are still some challenges that we're working on. Um, we have some technological challenges, firstly, um, that, are, that are, we're still dealing with. Uh, we require a lot of content for VR. Um, and, and these challenges are, are about VR in general, things that we're dealing with as well, mass market adoption. Um, we require a lot of content. Right now, most of the people who are making content are indie game developers. Um, they're usually smaller teams. It usually takes them a while to make a game. Usually the games are a little bit smaller. Um, but they're doing actually the heavy lifting right now in terms of, of sort of investigating what's it from the consumer focus. Like what's, what the arts um, is being made and what things are working. Um, but we need more of it. There's still only a limited amount right now. Um, Right now, we have uh, room scale positional hand tracking is uh, is kind of a challenge uh, because that's uh, oh um, because it's, it's it's so much technology. Um, it requires tech savvy users in order in order to do this, um, and the computing power and the speed and the cost of it. Uh, it requires really large, expensive computers um, that are required to be very fast. And they're very expensive. Um, this is a little bit difficult to come by. Um, nothing's quite um, plug and play, nothing's cheap quite yet. Although that's going to be fixed eventually. This is one of my favorite images ever, just because I like to work, because I owned all of these on top at some point. And then I owned this thing at the bottom at some point, but before they switched to the new, um, the 
the new port for the, for the headphones. Like but prior to that, I owned this device. Um, and so VR is going to get better, and these are all things that are currently being worked on. Um, there are also some personal and cultural hurdles, um, and this is where I get really excited. Um, the big thing about VR that's a problem is that it requires actual physical space. Um, most people don't have a spare bedroom um, in their house, and most people are just strangely um, attached to coffee tables. I, I'm pretty sure that coffee tables are a thing of the past. Uh, there are no coffee tables in the future. Um, <laughs> but it, it does require a personal commitment of space that most people don't generally have, so it actually requires people to literally like rearrange their entire lives in order to have this. Um, it also requires tech savvy, and I mentioned it before, but I, keep in mind, like, these are, you have to know what's all, like, not everybody knows what's all on their computer. Um, knowing what video cards are required, knowing what processing power is needed, um, and, and needing to troubleshoot it. You know, the Vive and, and all of the devices right now require some level of troubleshooting in order to, like, make sure everything's working on time. What if a lighthouse isn't syncing with the other? Why am I not getting, you know, visual in my display? These are all things that there aren't really a whole lot of guides yet to help people figure this out. It's not quite intuitive. And the last thing is the lack of situational awareness. It makes people feel incredibly vulnerable to put on these headsets. Now, there are some things coming in to help with this. Um, so the Vive has a knock-knock feature, that if someone comes in and they want to talk to you, they can hit knock-knock on the computer, and it will alert you in the Vive, like, hey, somebody wants to talk to you outside the Vive. It's a little bit less uh, less startling than having someone like come shake you with that. But at the same time, um, well, that's how well, we still don't have like a cat alert, or, or an infant alert, or, or a random friend who thinks they're funny is coming up to sneak up on you alert. Um, and so this puts people in a very vulnerable position, so it's still, and, and you know, there's, there's a lot of fear um, associated with that. So currently this is mostly an enthusiast market. Now, I have a couple asterisks here because the PSVR launched literally a week ago. Um, the PSVR has about 40 million units at the one, um, and that is um, a lot of potential VR devices out in the wild. Um, it is less expensive, um, and it is uh, a lot more plug and play. You have the console, so you can just plug in the PlayStation VR. Um, there are some other, they, they make compromises in order to do this. Um, some of the tracking is not the tracking you can on the Vive, for example, it's not 360, it is 180, you know, and uh, and there have been, you know, some troubleshooting that still needs to be done because it tracks via a camera, as opposed to tracking you within an entire space. There's still some some finicky, like finicky little things that you need to sort of like troubleshoot in order to get it working correctly. But I'm really excited to see what happens now that the PlayStation 5, the PlayStation VR is out in the wild. So we'll see what happens there. So what's coming in the future? This is where I get excited. Um, so we're going to have, uh, the first thing, I mean, these are all things that are going, these are things that are already being worked on, so these are things that are pretty easy to predict, predict in the near term. Um, VR will be untethered. Uh, that's already being worked on. Everyone's working on untethered VR. Having a large cord attached to your computer is not the optimal way to play, uh, and they are already working on fixing that. Um, uh, we can expect better hands and greater body tracking, um, so that you'll be able to have <coughs> presence that matches your real life presence in the virtual world, in the, in the, in the VRs. Um, emergent genres is something I'm actually really interested in. Um, these are genres that will utilize the medium in ways that we didn't expect, in ways that can only be done in VR. Um, I have no idea what we're going to see from this. Um, this is um, one of the things that I'm really excited to see what everybody comes up with, as we're all sort of heads down working on these things. Um, Social immersive presence is already on route. Um, we have games like High Fidelity and Alt Space and Rec Room and Pool Nation, and people are starting to work in um, in uh, social immersive presence. But this is going to get um, even more sophisticated and nuanced. We'll have things like better um, avatars and uh, and better better gestural communication, which is like a rudimentary way. We'll have we'll have better more nuanced expression. Um, and lastly, so this is this last one. Is we're going to um, start developing etiquette. Um, so right now, there's not a whole lot of etiquette. Um, like for example, like my stupid friend who thinks it's fun to come up and tap me on the shoulder. 
um, when I'm in VR to try and scare me. Um, th these are things that as more and more people have VR, more and more people are going to start developing ways of interacting with VR, um, both outside of it to the person inside VR, and people inside VR are acting when they encounter the outside world. Um, so for example, we have a lot of this already developing our studio. So we have a rule in, in our studio that whoever's in VR has the right of way. <laughs> if someone has the VR headset in, it is your obligation as the person not in VR to walk around them. Um, if there is no way for you to walk around them, you might get too close and they might hit you, you are obligated to raise your voice a bit, which feels weird, to say, hey, I'm behind you. Um, we have to give people notification of these things, or else you violate the trust of the VR space, right? We have these, these we make this, this promise that like, oh, everything's going to be clear in your space, you're not going to hit anything or be harmed by anything, and if you are, you've violated that trust. Um, and so we'll get, we're going to come up with more rules of etiquette about, about these sorts of things. Um, oh, another one um, that we're just starting to form is, um, if you put someone in VR, don't leave them there. <laughs> so like if you're taking somebody through a demo and you're like, all right, here you go, ready? Go demo. You can't just disappear. It's also, we consider it bad form if you switch people in the middle. So like if I put you in VR and then I leave and I leave you, and then your friend is the one who's there when you come out. Like all of these things are just very jarring experiences. When you go in and you come out to expect a world and the world is not what you expected. Um, we're also going to be developing a lot of language. We've already started doing some of this. Um, but we're going to start developing language to sort of talk about some of these experiences that we have in VR. Um, and, and, and how we talk about them and convey them to other people. Like there's, um, we're already talking about um, incept is it inceptioning. When you play a VR game within a VR game. <laughs> like when you go in and like say there's, you go in there's a virtual console, like you're in a virtual arcade and on that is another game. And you come out of that game and you're like, oh cool, I'm at the console. Oh no, wait. I messed up. Now. So like we have words like this, time dilation is another word that's existed for a long time, that's the first time it's being applied to VR. That sense of losing track of yourself when you're in VR, because you get so focused and you enter like kind of a bit of a flow state, you get entirely focused and you come out and you realize what you thought was 15 minutes was actually an hour and a half. Um, and, and the words and the language and the, and the cultural like expectations and etiquette are all different. So, postmortems and knowledge here are the most important things we can do as a community right now. The current crop of your devices are really new, and we're just getting started developing experiences for it. Um, as an industry, we don't really have a whole lot of best practices. Um, we don't have development guides for the VR point yet. Um, so it's a vast unknown entity. And the community is generally filled with the sense of like awe and wonder and curiosity and finding the potential limits of it. So if you're not already, I really, really urge you to like join us. Um, you know, discuss, like do, I mean, do whatever you can do to sort of help this medium, to, to be involved in this medium. Discuss, try, build, fail, theorize, uh, try again. Um, and, and share it while it's still breathing. Um, but ultimately, like, because they can see over the walls of the cubicle, yeah. and that's an experience I've never had. Um, so it's clearly really broken. Um, so, so we did actually, and we actually found um, some other things, even more height restrictions, is that, um, so um, we've had children who 
play. And we've had parents tell us, like, hey, um, this is hilarious. When my kid plays, they can't actually reach the, for, especially in the kitchen. Um, there's, for those who haven't played it, there's the way you, um, the way you pull, start the next task is you pull an order up card, which is on a circular, like, turnstile up here that you pull from up here. Now, um, so we did, actually did implement in the Vive um, a smaller human mode. So if you are in the museum before you choose the first job, um, it's already low to the ground. We specifically put it low to the ground, thinking that people who were smaller humans would think to look in front of them. Um, but there's a cabinet that if you open, there's a little lever that you can pull that says smaller human mode. And it actually scales the person up so that they can interact with everything. So we did actually take that into consideration. Um, ultimately, would we want everything to be the perfect height for everyone? I, I don't know. I, I live in a world that's much bigger than um, I'm really used to it. I, I kind of, I don't know, if everything was suddenly my size, like it's a novel ideal. Um, I would almost think that I would be playing with a kid's set. I have actually sat at legitimate kids' tables before and did not realize that those were, that those were not for grown-ups. Um, so, I mean, ultimately, like, I don't know, it depends on the game you're making. I think some games you would want to be custom painted for everyone, um, but I think for other people you're going to want to sort of just have that stable reality. Um, you mentioned before that VR, uh, the identity of yourself in VR is very like you or you in mm -hmm. your plan in there. Do you think that's going to be an obstacle for games where you play a protagonist or for games where you have different options for personalities? Like, um, is the really intrinsic identity and a personal perspective is going to get in the way of narratives that require you to play a I mean, that, I think that really depends. I'm always a proponent for making as many games as humanly possible and trying everything. And there are times, so here's, here's my big bet. Um, I will, if I play a game where I can be anyone, I'm invariably myself, every single time. Um, but other people I know make different characters and they act in different ways. Being you still gives you that opportunity. You can play full on renegade in, in, in jobs you want to. You can like, destroy everything and throw things at your coworkers and be mean. Like this is a thing you can absolutely do. Or you can be nice or you can just be efficient or there are a variety of things. If you're asking them to put on a particular character, I think that's something that you would probably want to message very clearly in the design. Because otherwise people are going to be whoever they feel like being at that time. So you would want to invite them to be the person that you want them to be. Does that make sense? What is the single most interesting or intriguing virtual reality experience that you have Out of all the virtual reality everything experiences? That you, everything that you've seen. Interesting or intriguing. I've actually been seeing some remarkable music visualizers. Um, and the reason why I really like it is that it takes the medium that I already know, music, and it takes the medium I already know, like sight, and it sort of fuses them and lets me understand music in a way that I previously didn't understand. Um, and it allows me to get more into it. I'm also really terrible with music. Like, I'm really garbage at it. Um, I, I, I've heard that often with music, you have like multiple instruments, um, maybe maybe like tracks of harmonies is a thing. I never hear any of them. But I've been seeing some music visualizers that allow you to pull pieces of these tracks forward and sort of focus on it. It's really, it's really fascinating. And then there's other stuff like in terms of like interaction design. Um, I really recommend uh, Fantastic Interaction. It has a lot of fantastic interaction designs. So there are like bits of various games that I can recommend for, for things, but music visualizers have really been, especially indie music visualizers. Like I can't even tell you what to go download from Steam right now because I don't care. That's all. Yes? Um, any stories to tell about adoption or utilization for older adults, uh, 60, 70, 80 years old, and uh, um, comfort level with this space versus other technologies that might be? So we specifically sought out in our in our playtesting people of all various ages. Um, we specifically wanted to see like how they interacted with the space, um, and we specific and the people who we brought in actually had a really easy ability to use it, um, and we attributed this to the lack of abstractions um, because they didn't actually have to press buttons or like learn a series of especially if these people didn't have a lot of access to. Um, video games or hadn't played a lot of video games in the past. There was a large barrier to entry to bringing them into playing video games, traditional video games. We found they had a very, very easy time 
in VR. Uh, we've also found that they um, didn't get nausea. So I, we have a feeling about nausea, and I'm just going to go ahead and talk about this because everyone wants to know about motion sickness. Um, we actually know what causes motion sickness. We've known for a long time. Simulator sickness is something that we've known about for ages. We know, we know what causes it. We know what's going to cause it. Um, so if you um, make somebody sick, sick in VR, I mean, if, if VR makes you sick, that's a developer choice. Like at this point, like they've decided to do that, and why they're mean, I don't, I don't know why they would do that. And so we specifically went out of our way to make sure that there was no sickness. I'm actually terrible at it. I'm that person who's in the grocery store, like talking about my game. So it's like, oh, I'd love to play VR, but oh, I get so much sick. Like, what are you doing this afternoon? Do you wanna, do you wanna come hang out? I know we just met, but I have something I'd like you to try. And I want you to tell me if you get sick. We now have a running bet um, with various people. Like, I, you won't want to drink if you get sick, but if you get sick, I will. I will buy you a drink. Yeah. Um, it's something that we actually do, and this, it, it's, it's a very easy world to sort of fall into because we don't mess with things. We don't have any artificial locomotion at all in Job Simulator. Um, there is no abstraction of movement. We're not messing with your inner ear. We're not spinning you around. We're always hitting 90 frames a second, and all of these things eliminate, virtually eliminate um, uh, motion sickness. I had someone actually uh, recently, I was doing a demo, she told me that she wanted to do VR, that she loved VR, she loved the idea of VR, but she had had like a couple of concussions in a row. And even looking at a car driving by made her sick. And I said, well, I, I, I feel bad for you. Like normally I bet people who drink and I do the whole thing, but like, I don't know, I don't, I don't feel good about that now. And she's just like, well, I want to love VR, so I'm gonna try it anyway. But just so you know, I have thrown up on 12 years before. <laughs> they made you sick, I, they deserve it, I guess. Um, she came out and she was so excited. She was like, I didn't get sick. I didn't get sick. Like, and she was elated, and I was just like, yeah, she's like, VR's for me. I was like, VR can absolutely be for you. Um, so yeah, that was sort of my long-winded talking about. Oh, back, way back, friend. No, that's me. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can. Uh, um, I, I'm curious about the same way you want to have all of the apps and everything you're interacting with the game, your little physical object that's connected to all the yep. VR. So I was playing the Batman game, Myself, I'll be absolutely held actually to the opposite. It's just when I want people to play, I just hold them out the game experience because they're, they're trying to get things. And I'm wondering where you get the motivation and where you being able to physically interact with stuff and actually making it more difficult. Is there people you play on the experience? I, I know this experience, I've played this experience. I also had a problem with the exact same one. Um, I had played after one of my developers, and when I got on, got in, it was apparently sized for him. So when I got into the Batman experience, my belt was up here. So I'm literally trying to grab objects, and it was incredibly immersion-breaking. Um, the other problem is that not all of the things that you um, could do in Batman VR. There were things that it wouldn't allow you to do, like the grappling hook only works, for people who haven't played it yet, there's like a grappling hook, but you can only point it at certain locations in order to grapple, it's, that was a thing that I had. Um, but you're putting something on somebody's body, um, and you're putting it on their body in a place where you think it's going to be um, convenient, it's not gonna be convenient for everyone. The minute you go into the realm of wearables, whether virtual or in real life. You're going to be dealing with a real, actual human body problem, and until you can actually start tracking that human body, um, I, I'm, I'm not sure wearables are, are the way to go about it. Now, I did see an interesting feature. It was in an old demo, I believe, of Arizona Sunshine. I don't know if they still have it. But you can put the ammo pack on your body, but you select it where you put it. And because the person chose where it went, and then it stayed wherever it put it, that became a more intuitive interaction between to. But just assuming that you know where somebody's waist is, I'm going to tell you, it's going to fix problems. Hmm? Oh, I have one more question. Okay. Who was the last question? I saw somebody. Yeah, let's do it. Um, so you talked a little bit about keeping the, the play space and like the play space and the play space and Um, I don't think the restrictions are going to be a forever thing. Um, people are already doing some really interesting stuff with um, different teleportations and portals and stuff. Um, Cosmic Trip does a fantastic job of letting you navigate through multiple spaces by letting you pull up these uh, 
these little portals that you then step through. Um, I also highly recommend budget cuts level of, of teleportation, which um, is, is actually used as a feature in the game and allows you to navigate through the space. Um, we're still figuring out teleportation. Um, our solution at this stage with VR was so new is to make a confined space and make it as interactive as possible. That will not always be the case. Um, but we're still, there's all so much going on. I see so many different um, suggestions for artificial locomotion that don't feel bad. Like I've seen a running in place one, you know, I've seen um, one where you grab and you pull and you pull yourself across it. Like people are trying everything to try and get it so you can navigate that space and access a wide world without feeling sick and also feeling natural. Um, and I, I absolutely believe that that's going to be a thing that we figure out. Now. I just don't think we've quite figured it out. Not so much that we have an industry standard. Oh, and that was my last question. So I'm sorry, but thank you so much.